Today, it's the Thief River Falls City Council at large. Uh, Alderman's position that is up for election in November in about three weeks here. Uh, voters will have a choice, and both uh, Jason and, and Doug joining us here uh, this afternoon. Uh, welcome, gentlemen. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. We'll Thank uh, you. be addressing uh, a few issues and give you an opportunity to to uh, address some of those and your thoughts on them, too. But uh, first off, uh, an introduction, if you would, uh, to our to our voters and our listening public. Um, Doug, uh, you're the challenger. Why don't you start? Okay. Uh, I um, I grew up in Thief River, Lincoln graduate, 75. It's been a while. I have a four-year degree from Northwestern in business. I have a Master of Divinity from uh, Reformed Theological Seminary. And I spent uh, quite a few years down the cities. You know, I had a lawn maintenance company, did pulpit supply, and back about 2006, I came up here again to take care of a aged parent. And after she passed away, I started working at DigiKey, and I did pulpit supply up here and through a number of churches. And right now, I'm pastoring a church in Grigla, Community Bible Church, and I'm still working at DigiKey. Okay. I should uh, I did not uh, Doug Bergman. Uh, okay. We did not. Uh, uh, give your last name, but uh, anything else? Uh, is that's just a run, quick yeah. rundown. Yeah, that's what we're looking for. Yeah, uh, Jason Arstead joins us, and Jason is the uh, sitting council member uh, running for re-election. And uh, Jason, if you would uh, tell yeah, us a little bit I'm, more about uh, you. Yeah, my name is Jason Arstead, and incumbent right now. Um, I have three children, two adults, one that's still in uh, Lincoln High School, Um lived here my whole life born and raised here um funny thing is i moved uh from my parents house which was the north block of markley the last block i moved straight down the south markley last block and that's where i've been for 30 some years <laughs> <laughs> so um yeah no i've uh this community is a, is a lot to me so um looking forward to getting back in and, and keep some things rolling and all right good Let's uh, let's start. Uh, first of all, uh, Doug, why are you running? It's something that's been growing over quite a few years. I noticed, like over the last ten years, my property tax has been going up, 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 and right now it's in ten years it's doubled. I'm starting to wonder what is going on. And granted, you know there are a lot of high uh, price tickets that come in through um, the city, you no know, roads and sewer and all this. Um, I got curious, well, how, why is it this high and why is it going down? And granted, you know, it's, we have the school and the Pendleton County, too, far the, as far as the property taxes. But I got curious. I started digging in and finding out what's going on and are there better ways of uh, managing the money, our expenditures, and... Can we be far more efficient how we're doing doing business in the city? All right. Uh, Jason, uh, again, not your first rodeo. So what are the reasons that, that bring you back to the to the uh, ballot? Um, you know, I really feel like our council has made some pretty good good progress on a few things. And there's, a, there's some stuff I'd like to see continue. Um, and granted, like, like Doug says, you know, taxes are are an issue to everybody. And, uh, you know, I'm a blue collar guy. I'm a, a business owner myself. Um, I, I work just like everybody else. Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm part of this community and, you know, getting on the tax stuff though, we do have five entities that go into our taxes and as far as the city portion, we have been pretty, pretty good over the last, I don't know, a few years of trying to really keep things pretty straight lined, you know, or flat lined. We, uh, it's a misconception when people see a uh, this 10% tax levy. That doesn't mean your taxes are going up 10%. And if you break down the five entities on there, you know, the city portion has been pretty flatlined. But, you know, there's always room for improvement. Um, but just like anything, your household costs have gone up. Costs for the cities go up, too. So, you know, it's, it's cost of doing business. Mm-hmm. All right. Uh, just... <clears throat> Uh, if I could, your your thoughts. Uh, of course, taxes have been on everybody's mind, primarily mm-hmm. this election cycle, because our school district All right. uh, has a referendum and, and wants to raise funds. And a lot of people are getting education 
on the different tax entities. Uh, but it, it has been a hot topic. Do you hear it in public uh, when you're when you're out? I've heard it. Yeah, I have too. I've uh, actually attended a couple of their meetings. Um, and this is another thing I wish people, um, the city, and and all of us, we're not real great at educating people, and we need to improve in that. But with what they've had been holding at the schools, and they have one on the twenty fourth at Challenger, but. I think people need to get out and educate themselves and understand the severity of some of these referendums. Um, I think it's very important because the school district is the heartbeat of our community. Any community that loses a school district, things start to uh, fade away, disappear. Pretty soon you lose your post office. Pretty soon you're not much of a town. So, Mm -hmm. I mean, to me, there's an aspect of uh, they are a heartbeat of our town. Doug, you any response to that uh, comment at all? Or? Yeah, I went to one of the meetings also. I got there late because I was at the uh, city council meeting. <laughs> <laughs> but it, one of the things I noticed that they gave a, a bulletin out on information. And one thing as far as educating and communicating, they need to do a better job of it. Because what I looked at it was a word salad is what they're basically showing us. And being in business, you have to be very precise in where money's going and how it's being spent or else you go out of business. And what I think they need to do is uh, line things up properly that's understandable, very precise, concise, Mm -hmm. and with specificity. And one thing they in there, they had these 60% was essential uh, classes and non-essential. And they need to separate those two and say, if they need to have these cuts, where are these cuts coming from? And explain why we're, why are they having the shortfall in the first place? And some of it comes into state aid not coming in. Did they have what I call the carrot stick? The state comes in and say, well, 100% fund a program. Then two years down the line, you fund 50%, mm-hmm. 25 How is that working out? I think that has to be communicated because if they're saying we have a shortfall as a result of um, uh, the change in that relationship. Mm -hmm. Uh, And I think uh, there would be an argument that there's a similar uh, uh, relationship between the state of Minnesota and the cities in the state of Minnesota Mm -hmm. also when it comes to mandates and taxes and and, and what's being asked. A lot of of things like, you know, we have the uh, the, – Self, safe routes to school grants with uh, some of our, our trails, sidewalks going to these schools. And and those are grants that we get that is only for that. You know, I wish we could spend some of this money in any way we could to, to do different things, but the school district also, when they get funding, it's tied to mandates and you can only mm-hmm. use things certain ways. It's like remodeling the depot. I mean, the American Rescue Funds, it's you can only use it for certain things. So um, a lot of people don't understand that, but if we don't use some of that, it will go back to St. Paul and we won't have that money. So um, it, it, it's it's hard to explain to some people. All right. <laughs> Good. Well, just one, one at least now for the time being, on, on taxes, the tax strain on taxpayers. And there, Jason, we'll start with you. Um, obviously, there are there are things, uh, salaries, uh, union contracts. You know, there there's going to be that two and a half, three, four percent increase or cost of living built into contracts. Uh, things are getting more expensive. So, how do we hold line and continue to hold line and still provide services that uh, we expect in our city? You know, I think ultimately we have to try to broaden our tax base, our capacity, and, and attract people to move here, and that'll help instead of putting the strain on people who live here your whole life. It, it sometimes feels like a punishment that you've lived here forever because we don't we don't broaden our tax capacity at all. Um, we got to find ways to attract people here, help out, spread that cost. Um, these salaries are not going to go away; they're going to keep going up. You have your cola every year. Um, insurances uh health insurance and everything is that's our one of the biggest expenses increases is insurance um and there is no way around that um 
like I said, the city has costs just like everybody. Running a small business like myself, you know, I, I deal with it all the time too. Um, we, we To me, we got to attract more people here, have a reason for people to move here, and just broaden this tax capacity. Doug, what how what would your be response on on holding the line and and still providing the well, services to this? One thing you need to do is look at where where's the bleeding, and what are what things are we have in the city that's just costing money and it's not really doing anything. <clears throat> Use an example like Annie's Park. Since I grew up right by there, there's one huge vacant lot. It's been like that forever. We could just end up like selling it and put housing up there and increase your tax base. I know some people get up. It's personal for some people uh, there, because there's a little park there. Uh, the the Car- Carnegie uh, lo- Old Library across from our present library, um, we could end up selling that also. And instead of just paying 70000 for a new elevator, have someone else take care of it. And sell it for a dollar and use it, increase our tax base. It's more efficient, you know, and go through, you know, what do we have that's just costing us a lot of money and we're not getting anything back from it? That could really help. All right. Thank you. Uh, Visiting with uh, Doug Bergman and Jason Erstead, the candidates for uh, city council at large. Uh, Doug, we'll start with you for your understanding of the city. Um, are there any? Is the city adequately staffed? Uh, is it overstaffed? We're talking parks and rec, city works, uh, water. You know, all the all the entities. Uh, what's your impression, or what do you see as far as city? I know? haven't heard any any complaints one way or the other, or compliments or complaints. Okay. So, I know I th- think it was eighty seven employees for the city, close close to it. Um, I haven't heard much one way or the other. So I know they have some temporary seasonal workers for the mowing lawns and things mm-hmm. like that. Yeah, but I haven't heard anyone really talking about it. Okay. Jason, what your your views um, on, on staffing? Certain departments, I feel that we may be a little understaffed. Um, public safety side of things, you know, I, I – so being on certain committees, I, I don't know the public work side a whole lot. Um, but I think we're pretty well staffed. But I, I do think there's a couple departments that are mm, could use a little help. Okay. I think we have, uh, for the most part, um, you know, we have some really great employees in this city, too. And some of these guys really work pretty hard. Uh, moving on to our next topic, uh, that is the Ralph Inkelstead Arena. In Thief River Falls, which, uh, of course, is uh, gifted to the community uh, two decades ago and um, is a wonderful facility, but also a very expensive facility uh, to operate. Uh, and we've had over the past few years some changes in in management and uh, the operation and, uh, and how that is all handled so, uh, Jason, we'll start with you. Your your thoughts uh, on the management and, and the direction of that facility. Oh man, you know the arena is a great place. It should be it should be a diamond for you know a gem up here in Northwest Minnesota. Um, will the place ever make money? Absolutely not. I mean that's unrealistic. Um, this is another donation that was given to us that, to me, it, it's. It's cost of doing business. I mean, that, that should be generating economic impact. Um, so if it's not making the money right at the arena, as long as there's events going on, they're hosting the hockey games, et cetera, and bringing people to town to spend money at our local businesses and our restaurants and our gas stations, um, that's the direction I'd like to see that go. Um, it's It's... It's one of those things that's tough, you know, and there's a lot of maintenance. Like right now we're putting that ice plant in, and I know we kind of catch some grief on that, but everything has a life cycle. It's just like at home. Your water heater has a life cycle. Your fridge has a life cycle. Everything has a life cycle. Um, Sometimes, you know, we don't have very good planning for for these things, 
in another 20 years, we're going to have to plan this again. Um, that's mm-hmm. just the reality of it. If we take care of the building, it should be around here for 80, 90 years. So this is going to happen again, and we need to plan for it this time instead of just, ooh, it's broken. <laughs> Doug, your, your thoughts on, on the Ralph Ingolstead Arena? Well, right now we have two hockey arenas, the hockey and the Ingolstead. And that's what it is, is a hockey arena. And I'm wondering why you keep it open year-round. Why not just shut it down for six months a year? It would end up cost The cost just itself would be reduced drastically. Utilities was like 300. Right now it's like something like 380000 or something, and uh, staffing of benefits like seven hundred thousand or six hundred thousand, uh, you can end up cutting costs dramatically if you just shut it down. And you know you can always open it up for like the home and garden for a few days, and or some other special event. But you don't have to keep it open and staffed year round. I think cost wise, it'd save us a lot of money. All right, thank you. Uh, moving on uh, to our next question, uh, and this one we'll start with Doug. Um, give us your your view, your impression on what the city's role should be in economic and business development. Well, one one of the biggest problems we have is housing. If you want to expand businesses, that means you're going to have more people, and you're going to have to find a way of housing them. And like I brought up with Annie's Park, you can put up a whole bunch of number of houses on that. And are there other places where you can have housing development in order you can bring people in? Because I know like with uh, DigiKey, they're pulling in people from all over the place because there aren't <clears throat> enough people here already. And for business development, if you want to bring new businesses in, then you're going to have to deal with how you house all these people. And I'm sure... Building more apartments may not be uh, the best way of doing it. You know, even starting creating starter homes would be help. You know, these would be smaller homes, but you can build a lot more of them. Because one thing you have to have is housing. And then once you have housing, then the business, you can bring more people in. Jason, what would your response on the city's role in economic and business development? Well, um, we had just hired... Almost a year ago, I think it was now, we got Richard Baker as an economic director for the city, which was a good step forward. He's a he's a great guy, knows what he's knows a lot of connections. Um, far as getting back to housing and, and and stuff, you know, this has been an issue for many years, and it's not a it's not an easy egg to crack. It, it, first of all, you got to have developers. It's not up to us to build houses. It's not up to us to build apartments. Um, If a developer comes in, it's ultimately up to them what they want to build. I mean, I agree. I think it'd be great to see more houses, but that's not ultimately up to us. It's, you know, up to the citizens. If they want to move here and build a house, um, I don't know. I mean, it's a hard, it's a hard thing, you know, between the daycare and housing. It's, it is tough. Mm -hmm. Uh, the um, prevalent thing in the past has been uh, some sort of uh, tax break uh, for industry or for uh, business. Um, is that as prevalent now as it has been in the past? For businesses, I'm not sure, but I know there was a uh, there was a program for houses, um, a tax abatement for a few years if you built new. Um, there are some programs. I'm not. Mm-hmm. Hundred percent sure with all of them. Um, that's a good question, you know, with with our economic guy. But there was a program out there for a while for building houses. Doug, Doug do you think is, think programs like that would be beneficial, or it could um, be. It could be. I think if you removed a lot of the restrictions or regulations, I, that would go a long ways. Also, businesses <laughs> uh, will tell you that regulation is the great inhibitor. I think if you made it easy to build, they're, they're more likely to come than just uh, carrot on the stick. We're visiting with uh, Jason Erstead and uh, Doug Bergman, candidates for city council at large in the city of Thief River Falls on our candidate forum, again brought to you in part by uh, Tonabels and uh, Thief River Falls Radio 
And uh, a few more questions. Uh, and uh, Doug, we'll start with you on this one. The state of Minnesota has, uh, in the last year, legalized uh, recreational cannabis. Um, the uh, city of Thief River Falls currently in a in a moratorium, uh, waiting for direction and waiting for you know to, to study the issue. But eventually, um, will either be asked to open their own or license uh, establishments to to market cannabis to the general public. Um, your thoughts: uh, Should the city be involved? In uh, in just like a municipal liquor store, only uh, or or should it be a licensed uh, entity? Or uh, I'd like to keep the moratorium for a while because I think it's too soon to tell the impact of you know smoking pot um, on the individual, and I think there's a lot of data coming out that it's it could be detrimental. So I'd like to keep a moratorium. There's also industrial hemp. For you know, pain relief. It's not mm-hmm. no yep. non THC type of products, which is just fine. But for those who want to use it for recreational use, I would, for the time being, just keep a moratorium on it if possible. Jason, your response. Uh, what, what's what's the city? What do you see the city's role, or or how involved should it be? Well, I think ultimately, when when legislation everything gets straightened out. Um, I guess my my opinion is, um, <laughs> you know, the liquor store is uh, they do a big internal transfer to our our levy. Um, it is an opportunity for them to, you know, make another revenue stream, and uh, it would ultimately be a bigger uh, um, transfer into our levy again for operating costs, but. You know, I'm I'm really going to be honest. I'm really unfamiliar with uh, the marijuana and stuff. Uh, we've been doing some talking. Once again, Richard Baker, our economic guy, has kind of took the, the lead on this. Um, but that's just one of those things. I mean, uh, it might be a good revenue stream. I don't know. Yeah, yeah, Doug, yeah, so you can. There are places like Denver where they've got made it legalized. The, the social cost is really high as far as crime and everything else that they don't factor into it. They'll talk about the revenue streams, which you, you will make money on it, but there's a social cost. And will the social cost outweigh the benefits? And I think you, know, you use a basic um, business model. If the costs outweigh the benefits, <clears throat> you end up losing on it. And I, this is why I think you need to wait and see what that data says. I think ultimately on that, you know, I mean, I kind of agree with that too, but we have to allow a number of businesses or establishments to open up when it's time. So somebody's going to do it. All right. All right. Thank and you. If we can capitalize on it, somebody else is going to anyway. It's going to be here. That's the trouble with legislation sometimes passing things that aren't really <laughs> thought through for some of the smaller municip- municipalities and, and cities. Um, Everybody's trying to figure out what's going on here, and it's it's hasn't been an easy thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and I, and, and Thief River Falls is not alone. That's there are there are municipalities across the state who are uh, have done the same thing. I uh, said, well, just think, let's put on the brakes here until you know, we get. I think cleared. people forget, you know, being on a city council like this, that we're not legislators. We're not we're not a party. We don't run on a party line. We are just. Basically, we're a board of directors of a business, and, and we're supposed to make this thing operate. So, um, we're, we're not, we don't make policy and, and laws. So, all right, thank you, Doug. Uh, hypothetically, Doug, if they're if they're if you're elected and 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 they say, all right, Doug, you can do what you can do one thing, and it's and it's going to go through. Yeah, you know, there's no opposition. You got one. You know, what's going to be? What's the one thing that you would do as a city council? member <laughs> there's a whole bunch of things i'd like to do i'd like to what i'd like to do is uh, take ralph Engelstead and treat it like <clears throat> ice hockey arena and close it down for six months a year and open it up on special occasions all right jason same question to you hypothetically uh, again if, if you if they said here's carte blanche you pick one thing you can do it we're all behind you 
Yeah, I tell you the truth is just drive some economic growth into this community for our local businesses, and and uh, I'd just love to see the place grow a little bit, spread out this tax capacity, and and uh, bring back the pride to this town. You know, I grew up here. I've like I said, I've lived here my whole life. There's a lot of great people in this community. Um, you know, COVID's changed a lot of things. People are a little different, but if we could bring back that town pride, you know, which there is, we just got to get back to it. Mm-hmm. Um, I'd just like to see our community just kind of come together again. Yeah, we're, we're nearing the end of our time uh, already. Uh, I'm going to give you an opportunity, uh, Doug, if there's anything Jason has said that you you know disagree with or, or want to address and and then jason will give you an opportunity if there's anything uh doug has, has said specifically if not we'll just move on to our closing comments so doug? nothing specifically you know it's i don't think you know i don't think we're that far off you know as you know we may th- make difference things like you know the Car- carnegie building or the annie's park or you know the vacant lot or something but uh, I think there's a general agreement that we want to make things more efficient. There's a tax issue for you know there's the pressure on the homeowners is increasing because incomes are not going up, but costs are going up, and there's a stress taking place and it's something we need to look at and how can we be far more efficient in what we're doing Jason, your response. No, I agree with all that. Um, the only the only thing I'm going to say a little bit about is Annie Park. Uh, yeah. Now I f- I fundraised to build that playground. <laughs> and, you know, we fought. Our neighborhood really fought to to save that place because it was up for sale um, okay. for townhomes okay. um, back in 2011, 2012. Oh, okay. So you know, I invested a lot of time, personal time, a lot of personal money. I put on three years of fundraising for the playground <laughs> and, and I'm not, you That's may fine. not have known that. No, so, I no. um, there's been aspects of some city parks disappearing and stuff. And I, I just, I'm a, I'm just a big believer in green space. And when you do develop them green spaces, they're never available again. You know, we can annex in property. We can, we can spread out, but you can't get what's back in there. And that's important. Um, you know, People play with their dogs out there. It's a very used park, but there's many used parks. So um, children, you know, safe places for them to play is, I guess, going back to, you know, public safety is a big aspect of mine. Um, and with the safe routes to school and all this stuff. So uh, we need them play areas. All right. Well, as we uh, close, uh, Doug, we're going to give you an opportunity, uh, closing comments, and and why should we vote for Doug Bergman in November? I'm motivated. I, I've i seen, you know, issues. I think there are changes that I believe need to take place. And I think the city needs to prioritize what's important and versus what is not important or essential versus not, and to be able to streamline what's going on in the city and just to be more efficient. And it's not a it's not a rebuke or anything to what's going on now, but I think there's the pressure's on to do more. I think that's what needs someone who's motivated to do it. I am motivated. So Jason, um why should we vote for you? <laughs> well, you know, I guess I'm I'm the same way. I'm a hometown boy. I like I said, I've lived in my same house ever since I was in high school. Um, motivated, you can say that. I'm committed. Um, I've gone through, <laughs> through my terms, I've gone through five brain surgeries and I only missed one council meeting. Um, I go to many meetings with the school board, with other other entities to, to try to help out. Um, and I just want to continue. I want to move this town forward. Um, I think there's good potential Bring the bring the community back together. All right, thank you. Yeah. Um, uh, Doug Bergman, Jason Erstad, the candidates for council at large. Gentlemen, I want, first of all, I w- want to uh, thank you both for uh, putting yourself out there, uh, doing the civic thing, and, uh, and uh, um, 
you know, it is not easy necessarily at times to run for office and to, to make yourself available for public service. So we thank you for being part of the process. We thank mm-hmm. you for joining us and and sharing you. sharing a little bit about who you are and mm-hmm. and and what your thoughts are. An opportunity to so maybe know you a little bit better before we cast our ballot here. Uh, good luck in a, in a couple of weeks to both of you, and uh, thank you again for taking part. Thank in you our, for in our yeah, process. Thank you. Inviting us, and thanks, Tonabells, for sponsoring the program. And yeah, fantastic. Yeah. And uh, and uh, hopefully, uh, however it goes, uh, you'll both be involved yeah. in in our community. <laughs> oh, absolutely. Because we need no matter what. we need we need, uh, we need council members, and we need general public to yep. to uh, be working towards a better thief or false. So, thank you very much. Thanks. Well, All right, there you have it. Our candidates for uh, the uh, councilman at large, alderman at large. November 5th at the ballot box here in Thief River Falls and our candidate forum brought to you by Tonabells and Thief River Falls Radio.